Hello and welcome to this conversation with Lauren Wilkinson about his new book, Circles and the Cross, Cosmos, Consciousness, Christ and the Human Presence in Creation, which is published by Cascade Books. Lauren is Professor Emeritus of Interdisciplinary Studies and Philosophy at Regent College in Vancouver. And it's a great joy to be talking to him about a book that's been many years in the making and uh, that's finally emerged into the light of day. Welcome, Lauren, and many congratulations. Yeah, well, thanks. I, I look forward to talking to you. Right at the start of uh, Circles and the Cross, Lauren invites his readers to join him on a journey to explore two mysteries, the cosmos and human consciousness, in the light of a third mystery, and that's the mystery of Christ, the figure at the heart of the Christian faith. It's an explore, exploration that takes in an extraordinary range of ideas, movements, and people, from astronomers, physicists, biologists, to philosophers, environmentalists, theologians, and poets. And driving it all is Lauren's key concern. What does Christianity, and specifically, what does the cross, its central symbol, have to do with the cycles of the natural world and the findings of science? Lauren, you, you make it clear at the start of the book, that uh, at the end of the book, actually, as well, that this long journey from the origins of the universe to the edge of the anth Anthropocene, as you put it, is very much a personal journey for you. And uh, I want to find out about a bit more about that in our in our conversation. So where did your interest in science really begin? Well, <clears throat> science, of course, means knowledge. Uh, <laughs> the word does. Uh, but particularly knowledge of, of the world that we're in. And I think I was fortunate in growing up to to realize that we really lived in 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 one world not a not a religious world and a and a natural world uh <clears throat> i i grew up uh, along a along a river in oregon on a, on a farm um and i i had the privilege of you know wandering through uh that that place those woods along that river and and getting to know the uh, the cycles of the natural world, and and I guess I and then as I got I got older I would go into the mountains on either side of the valley the Willamette Valley in Oregon and had a, a deep sense that these are volcanic mountains it was very obvious how they were how they were made that they were made over a great period of time um, and so I guess I was fortunate to never really have a sense of tension between what God what what I learned in Sunday school and Bible camps and and that sort of thing uh, about God and what I was learning from the natural world about God I never did feel a deep sense of tension with that so the uh, the problems I think sometimes uh, Christians struggle with with evolution and so forth never really were an issue to me because I I, I wanted to learn as much as I could about the natural world. Um, I didn't pursue science in my own academic training, um, but I've always uh, read a lot about science. I tried to understand how the world works um, from the, from plants and animals, the seasons, the rivers, uh, geology. Uh, there's not a lot of geology in the book. I think I'm deeply fascinated with geology almost more than any of the other sciences. Yeah, there's a there's a fascinating uh, section about the the, uh, the Missoula episode. Yes, uh, the, this the, yes, the valley this where incredible I grew up. event that actually shaped your valley. Yeah, yeah, I grew up in a very flat uh, farm va a valley of a very fertile soil, a Willamette Valley. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I should throw in here one of the reasons that I published this book with Whip and Stock. Is that they're situated just 20 miles upriver from me in the same watershed in Eugene, Oregon, and it just seemed right. Um, and they also the, the 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 their imprint is Cascade, and uh, on their website they had some of the same mountains that I grew up uh, climbing. So it just seemed right to publish it with them. But the the Willamette Valley uh, was tiresomely flat for me. I wanted mountains, and we didn't get to the mountains very often. 
And it was only recently that I learned that the, uh, that the Willamette Valley is flat because it's um, the aftermath of huge flooding that happened when an ice dam broke uh, in the interior, uh, probably somewhere in Montana, and uh, massive floods of water uh, roared out to the ocean and took silt up the valley and deposited the level land that I had to uh, uh, co corn and, and mint in when I was growing up. <laughs> so yeah, but those are the sorts of things I've always just been fascinated by. How, how, how did this landscape get here? That sort of thing. So you spent your life, you know, your early early life on a, on a farm. You were working hard on the farm as well as uh, doing your schoolwork. Um, and it was clearly a, 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 a very committed Christian family as well. Uh, yeah, it was, and uh, uh, intelligent, thoughtful folks, but not not educated, really, not very educated. I was the first uh, first person in my family to, to really go to college. In fact, I, I I I should say, by the way, that we we spent half our time farming, but half our time logging. Uh, we kind of grew up on the edge of the frontier, so we had to cut the forest down in order to find a place to farm. And so uh, the farm got bigger and bigger as I grew, simply because we were destroying the forest. I didn't really, I, I, that was the sort of thing we did. But I, uh, as I've grown up, I realized, uh, you know, in some ways, what a tragedy the nature of logging in this part of the world has been. Um, in my own experience, it I I, I find it uh, ironic and and in some sense kind of wonderful that the last big Douglas firs on uh, old growth Douglas firs on our property were sent down to provide money to send me to college. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's kind of intertwined with uh, with logging. Yeah, I mean, that, that is deeply and ironic, I, isn't it? Because, I mean, here you, you know, now you're, the, you're a, a kind of um, an environmentalist, an activist. Yeah, although, uh, again, uh, not against logging. The question is, how, how are we present in the world? How do mm -hmm. we use the world? And so I've in some sense, growing up in the center of that question, but I didn't have the resources in my own Christian faith or background to really deal with it. I knew that I was saved um, personally, um, and and I've never questioned that early childhood decision, but I had no uh, resources really to connect um, the good news of the gospel, which was good news for me, uh, with the rest of the world, is it good news for the for for the world I was growing up in, and that I sensed was such a such a revelation of God as well. So, in some sense, my whole life has been trying to put those two stories together: the story of God's work that we have recorded in the Bible, and the story of God's work that we have recorded in the natural world. I guess that gets me back to why to to your question about science, uh, to study God's work in the natural world is to study science, whether you're a scientist or not, but that's the doing of science. Yeah. You, um, you, you've obviously read very widely throughout your life, um, but you went off to college to study literature, not to study uh, science. Was I mean, did was there ever a point where you thought, you could have gone the other direction. Would it? Would it? You know? Would, would you have? Would it appeal to you to study physics or something? Well, I was always fascinated by those things, but I, 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 I never was really tempted to go in that direction. And I should say, uh, I didn't go to college study literature. I, I, I was an anthropology major in college because I felt the only way one could really serve God fully was to be a missionary. And anthropology was a good training to be a missionary. I was hoping to work with Wycliffe Bible translators, who I thought then did good work, and I still think do wonderful work. Um, but gradually, uh, studying philosophy and literature, which I have always loved, um, I, I began to realize there's a much bigger, there, there are other ways of serving God, uh, other ways of learning about God and communicating about God than simply being a Christian missionary, which in my background was the was the highest Christian service. And I don't at all diminish or play down that as Christian service. But uh, but I went I went to college to be a mission to study to be a missionary. 
mm-hmm. then I then began to learn this huge world of of that that where science and literature interact. I talk quite a bit in my book about about the importance of the romantics to me, the mm-hmm. romantic poets who just who were who were trying and somewhat pushing back against the enlightenment idea that the scientific reductive way is the only way of knowing it was clear that there's a lot more being created being conveyed through the natural world um, than what can be reduced to 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 numbers and laws and so i the wonder that i had always felt as a as a young young person growing up um began to be I, i found it expressed in the poets especially the romantic poets so that was a it was a real revelation to me. So was the the decision to focus on the romantic poets a deliberate kind of attempt to try and address philosophical and practical problems that arose out of the Enlightenment, or did you just love the romantics? Well, not at that point. I I, I guess I I did go on um, academically uh, after after. Um, after I graduated from Wheaton, I, I got a master's degree in creative writing and the creative writing uh, seminars at Johns Hopkins University because I was interested in writing and I was able to write and was admitted to that program, wrote a novel there, which is blissfully unpublished and unknown, uh, and uh, and some poetry, and then uh, studied a lot of modern literature and then came back and uh, and got another degree in, in, in theology and uh, uh, biblical studies. Um, um, philosophy of religion, actually, at uh, Trinity, while I while I started teaching literature, I was a full time teacher and a full time student for for three years, while also having twins. I, mm. I don't think I could keep up with it now. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, and was teaching literature, and there's nothing, no way to appreciate literature like anything. It's no, no way to appreciate anything as good as teaching it, of course. Yeah. And uh, and then I went, and then. Again, my, my theology was kind of in one compartment and my literature was in another still, although I did a, a master's thesis trying to do a kind of, um, um, trying to look at the incarnation as a, as a way of understanding aesthetic theory. Uh, and it was, again, very, very unfinished, uh, imperfect work as I look back on it now. And yet I was already trying to, you know, Put, put these things together. How does our own creativity somehow relate to God's creativity? And how does it relate to the fact that in some sense, the incarnation is central, that God has come among us in Christ? Um, <clears throat> so um, I I went to, I got a doctoral degree at Syracuse University in a humanities program, which was a humanities degree in, the philosophy, in philosophy, religion, and literature. And that's where I began to see that the romantics were dealing with a big philosophical problem that they in fact had hardly recognized themselves clearly um and and so i i wrote about some of the romantics and then i wrote about a couple of modern thinkers owen barfield who was a good friend of c.s lewis's and a very perceptive thinker and uh, martin heidegger and uh so there i began to try to put together um, the philosophical problem that the romantics were wrestling with, which was simply, on the one hand, that um, the world seems full of meaning, and yet it seems to wait for us to be clear that somehow meaning depends upon us, and meaning depends upon the world. And where do we stand in in that tension? That they they I didn't fully recognize the I think the the tension, and both Barfield and Heidegger in, in different ways. Uh, help to answer the question, um, but it's this book, really <laughs> writing this book, that finally finished my doctoral dissertation from now forty years in the past, because I think I I think I found um, the key to how to put those two those two mysteries together. How does the meaning of the world relate to the meaning that we bring to it? And here I found a, a great help in the in the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. A, a yeah, profound well, we'll, we'll we'll come back to that, and, and you know to some of these other themes that you raised here but i mean um so there's this there's this fascination with the romantic poets there's this philosophical interest that you have as well in terms of the the problems that are raised by 
kind of certain um, aspects of, of the Enlightenment. What's resourcing you theologically? You're growing intellectually during this time. What's resourcing you at that point as when you were a student theologically and, and helping you to kind of put those worlds that you saw as kind of rather being separate, the personal, um, you know, faith that you have, along with this kind of massive interest in the world that you, you, you're you kind of acquiring? Well, those years uh, in college and graduate school, uh, I think my main theological sources were, I, mean, I studied theology, but I was sort of bored by it in seminary. It didn't seem to connect. Um, uh, but the, 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 real, the real theological sources for me were C.S. Lewis, um, Charles Williams, Owen Barfield, uh, who was kind of maverick Christian, but uh, certainly working in that same, same world, and, and J.R.R. Tolkien, who is not often recognized for the profundity of his theological thought, but it is quite profound. Um, those, those informed me, I think, in those years. Um, and I, I still am deeply, deeply influenced by them. But it wasn't really until I, and I, again, I'm jump, probably jumping ahead of where you want to go. It wasn't until I came to Regent and I began to rub shoulders with people like uh, Jim Houston and Jim Packer and Klaus Bachmuehl and, and other visiting faculty like uh, Colin, Colin Gutton and um, Jeremy Bigby, uh, the Torrances, that I began to see a way of putting this all together uh, putting putting the the insights of of the Christian romantics like uh, like Lewis and Tolkien um, together with uh, with a, a, a even bigger picture of theology and a, a, a Trinitarian theology. I think it's I think I think I've come to to be a much more explicitly Trinitarian thinker uh, as as I've grown older and as I've taught at Regent. Yeah, I mean, you the the book moves towards and it, and it has built right throughout this these kind of great themes of the incarnation of of Christ, uh, the Trinity, um, and then also this this interesting idea of of kenosis, which we'll we'll, we'll come on to. But in the context that you're you were studying and thinking these things when you leave home, you go to college. Uh, okay, it's a Christian college, but it's the 60s, isn't it? And there's this kind of intellectual ferment going on and um, also the rise of the environmental movement. And yeah. then, clearly at some point you begin to very much identify with that. What was what was the, the, the kind of occasion for that? Well, I don't know, there's a single occasion. Um, um, I people are always asking me, when did you begin to get interested in the environment? And my snarky answer, which I usually don't give directly, is when did you get interested in breathing? Um, <laughs> of course, uh, it, this is this is so deep. the the so-called environment, which is a, a terrible word for creation, which is this gift that we're that we're in the middle of, <clears throat> uh, is just all of us, and I think as the '60s, um, the '60s unfolded, and as our own intellectual progress unfolded, and I say our because Mary Ruth was very much a part of this journey, um, we began to take seriously the the counterculture. Um, I mentioned the, in my book the the impact that the whole Earth catalog had on me, which was trying to find, which was trying to look at the um, at, at the problems of our culture, that we we do we did need a, something to counter the the consumerist enlightenment based culture that had dominated, um, that was mad about anything that technology could do without asking questions about technology, especially in years after World War II, um, was asking questions about that, and at the same time was very critical of. The Christianity, which seemed to be comfortable with it, and uh, and so the environmental movement was a 
it was a religious movement, but it was pretty clearly, if not anti-Christian, at least non-Christian, but was looking at all sorts of other religious sources. Um, and uh, a very famous essay that written then by Lynn White uh, called The Historic Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, uh, written in the mid-60s, <clears throat> um, says, he, he concludes, and he's, it's not often recognized that he himself was a Christian and is writing as a Christian. Mm -hmm. He said, if we're going to solve our environmental problems, we either need to uh, invent a new religion or rethink our old one. Mm -hmm. And he points in some directions in that essay, which are not often pointed to. One is Eastern Orthodoxy, which, again, I've been increasingly influenced by, uh, because they, again, kept alive the importance of the Trinity, the Incarnation, a kind of sacramental view of things. Um, and uh, St. Francis. Um, St. Francis had an important part in my book. Um, yeah, I mean, if I could, before we move on to Francis, I mean, get, that essay by Lynn White, I mean, that I first came across it um, in, um, in, in actually one of um, Francis Schaeffer's books. He wrote a, a book called Pollution and the Death of Man, reprinted the whole article, and it was very much a kind of <clears throat> blaming um you know he Schaefer wanted to to explore this important theme of what we're doing to the planet um but uh you know he he reprinted this article and basically um held up uh Lynn White's essay as an example of the kind of antagonism of people who care about the environment towards Christianity and um so I wonder what made you pick it up in 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 such a kind of a positive well and maybe not just that article but actually because you know you can be very you can flippantly say you know uh, yeah yeah of course I'm interested in the environment why am I interested in breathing but actually a lot of Christians haven't been and weren't at that point and still aren't um, yeah. what made yeah. you go in that direction and say no this is actually something that I should care about as a Christian. Well, um, I, in my bones, I knew it. <laughs> uh, 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 so again, from the from the kind of childhood, I, I've never felt this sense of tension between um, the natural world and the and the sort of biblical world, the Christian world, however however small or large that was. And and so when I saw that world increasingly being diminished and degraded. I, I knew that this was that this was wrong, that this was somehow a sin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so somehow I, I needed to bring my own uh, understanding of the gospel together with this, together with uh, my, well, I need to see how the gospel related to the natural world. And <clears throat> again, uh, this was growing through graduate school uh, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And then we we went to teach at Seattle Pacific and teaching literature. I was in the uh, professor in the English department and would probably still be there if things hadn't turned out, if we hadn't taken a different turn. And the, the most significant turn it took was one that <clears throat> um, in the second, we love teaching literature, but we we somehow it wasn't connected to the problems that we were living with. We lived right near... Uh, a ship canal in Seattle, and uh, that was when the uh, the Alaska pipeline was being built. And so every day, almost huge barges were going up, taking taking material to the Alaska to Alaska to build the pipeline. And <clears throat> again, I'm not necessarily saying the pipeline was wrong, although it's now associated with the oil spill in Valdez and all kinds of other problems. But but I was in the middle. We were in the middle of this a burgeoning environmental problem on the one hand and growing uh, growing concern about doing something about it so I, I how do I how do I connect my teaching to this and so um, at that point Seattle Pacific had had and still has uh, uh, the support facility for an old fort on Whidbey Island and there were big huge wonderful officers houses that one of which had just become available for class use. And so we took a class up there one weekend, and we were so impressed with the feeling of being under the same roof, cooking together, eating together, 
with the same students we were teaching that we thought, you know, we, we need to do more of this. And so by the time we got back to the ferry, Mary Ruth and I had sort of sketched out an environmental studies program. And um, that seemed to me to be a way of putting all this together. So the next year we, we, we moved up there and for the next three years, we lived there uh, in every quarter with a good other group of students um, and trying to put our daily life, what we, how we lived, how we ate, but uh, uh, with with the big ideas, not with with the literature, with the environmental stuff, with the science stuff. We had we had scientists come and teach as well, uh, a marine biologist, a physicist, um, and uh, and at the same time we were realizing a deeper, on a deeper and deeper level that the problems of living with each other, which you're very aware of when you're you know, living under the same roof with a group of rambunctious uh, students um, are not unrelated to the problems of the way we want to treat the natural world. And that in some sense, the the, uh, the gospel has an answer to both. And, at this, and, I, <clears throat> and I, I, of course, when you begin looking at what uh, the Christian story has to say about the natural world, you find that it's certainly uh, you can't get away from the, the the link between creation and Christ. Um, in the beginning was in the beginning begins Genesis one, but John one sort of summing up the significance of Christ says, "In the beginning was the Word, and became who became flesh and dwelt among us." So Christ is somehow linked in that. To creation and and in john's prologue it says with without him nothing was made that has been made um uh, paul talks about all things holding together in christ the author uh, uh, of the hebrews um uh uses the same kind of language somehow there's a deep connection between christ and creation how and what exactly what that means i don't know that i, I I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out uh, but uh those those Mm. Um, those years trying to teach a group of students uh, about, uh, on the one hand, daily things about why recycling is a good idea, why you need to be aware of where your food comes from and where your garbage goes to. Um, on the one hand, we're doing that. On the other hand, we're looking at uh, big scientific questions and also uh, trying to understand the biggest picture of the gospel. And so those were wonderful years, both because of what I was able to to begin to teach, but also uh, uh, because of the uh, simply experience of teaching in a different way, teaching in a more intimate, personal relationship with students. Yeah. When did, the, um, when did the your interest in um, you obviously got a great enthusiasm for Saint Francis of Assisi, um, the Franciscan tradition actually, and particularly Duns Scotus. I mean, did this begin around now? About well, that. yeah, uh, I, 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 I certainly began to to find more about Francis, the person Francis, um, but then um, to go back to the that that environmental studies program for Seattle Pacific, it was it was very successful. Uh, students, it changed the students' lives, many students' lives. I'm still in touch with many of them. Many of them uh, spent, have have spent their whole careers doing uh, environmental work because of that program. Um, but it also was almost too successful. Our kids were approaching teenage. Um, people felt so at home in our house that they would sometimes we'd have 25 former students for Sunday dinner because they just wanted to come back. And we realized, you know, we've got it. This isn't, we have to stop this. We have to do something different. So we were looking at ways of doing the program differently. And then just at the last minute, I heard about um, the Calvin Center for Christian Scholarship, which is a kind of think tank that Calvin had just started this was the first their first topic their first year and they they were looking for um some non-reformed scholars to join a reformed core at calvin to work on on a topic that had the unfortunate title and this is the book that came out of it uh, the unfortunate title of christian stewardship of natural resources but nobody even Nobody even thought then about what a 
how, how that was not a very good title because it's more than natural resources. So uh, 10 years later, when we redid that book, we did it with this title, uh, Christian uh, Stewart, Stewardship of Creation. But uh, <clears throat> to get back to your Francis question, uh, that was a wonderful year. Uh, I, we worked, at a, a biologist, a physicist, an economist, a philosopher, and myself worked together for a year, producing those, those what led to those two books. Um, and I did a lot of reading in theology. One of the things I, I, I read was, um, and, and quite a bit of depth, is Duns Scotus. Well, I didn't read much of Duns Scotus. Duns Scotus is very difficult to read. Uh, <clears throat> but I began to learn about the significance of Duns Scotus and the significance of Francis on the whole scientific movement, which is a story that needs to be better known. Um, because... In, in a lot of ways, the Franciscan movement um, nourished early science. Um, many of the early scientists, people like uh, Robert Grosseteste, Roger Bacon, um, were, uh, were were Franciscans, and certainly Duns Scotus, um, and uh, somewhat discredited one, uh, William, o William of Ockham, who's important in the scientific, uh, in, in the story, and I, I talk about these guys, but they nourished early science. <clears throat> and... Um, and one of the ideas of Duns Scotus that, again, I didn't fully understand the significance of until much later, because he also was a great influence on this poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who I hope we still get to, uh, yeah. <clears throat> that the incarnation was not plan B of God for creation, but it was in some sense in God's purpose for the beginning, um, that God... Uh, intended to uh that this that this close relationship between god and creation uh was god's purpose from the beginning um there's some other uh scotist ideas that are very important to the inter to science but but what what this did this emphasis which for francis was not a philosophical one it was simply a deeply felt spiritual one this this identification of christ and this understanding that Christ and creation are very close together. It was Francis who first uh, brought animals into church at Christmas, for example. Uh, this, this, this is an idea that goes back to Francis. That that somehow um, Christ is that 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 creation is 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 brother son sister moon. Uh, that 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 we are fellow creatures, and this this had the this worked like yeast in science and in, in early science. To, to to develop into a science uh, that took the natural world much more seriously, empirically, than the earlier scientists had done, which saw um, the world itself as kind of imperfect. Uh, the, the only truth was in ideas in the mind. But what the Franciscans pioneered was the idea that, no, first you've got to look at things. You've got to pay attention. This world is important because it's the world in which God became flesh. So but these ideas came yeah, together in important things. There's another idea that you 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 spent quite a bit of time on, um, exploring some of these these things that came out of Dun Scotus. And that's the idea of yes, we're creatures, but we're kind of creatures that who are given a genuine otherness from God. There's a giftedness of being. And you, you know, you explore this thing of the univo no, no, university is, of being, which is very difficult. But this is a pretty critical issue, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm glad you used the word first instead of me, because uh, the university of being is not something that trips off the tongue. But, but what Hop, what Scotus meant by that is that when God <clears throat> created creatures, he didn't he didn't just make more of himself. He gave. He gave creatures a genuine otherness. They, and that's what the university of being is. That they, they, they have a being, in some sense, like gods. Uh, they are they are genuine. They're not just another part of God. They are other creatures, which uh, deserve to be regarded for their own sake. Another important idea in 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 Dan Scotus was um, <clears throat> the Latin term hexietas, which really just means isness. Things are important because of what they are, not because of some other idea that they represent, but because they are simply themselves. Um, and this this idea that creatures have genuine being um, 
suggests that that creation for the creator and here here I, I skate towards the edge of things that my Calvinist friends will dis disagree with me with. Um, creation is a risky business for the creator. Um, creatures are genuine. Cre creation is other. Mm -hmm. um, you see this even in, in Genesis 1. We often misquote that repeated phrase in Genesis 1. You know, God said that it, it was good. He said that it was good. But no, God doesn't say that it's good. He sees that it's good. It's already an otherness which God sustains, and that otherness is ultimately costly to God because creatures want to go their own way. And the ultimate example of creatures going their own way is the cross. Mm. So that, I mean, that's the sense in which you see the cross not just as a kind of an event in the life of Jesus, the, you know, the, on earth, as it were, but somehow or other, the cross is implicit in in the very act of giving being in creation to other other beings, other creatures that have the freedom to go their own way. Yeah, I think that's that's well said. Uh, uh, God, uh, it, it's implicit in creation. It, I, I I don't want to say that creation was a was a was a was a fall was a bad thing. No, but it opens the possibility. Of create of creatures going their own way, as and, and in fact that's that's how God creates. He he lets things be. In fact, that's um, that's that's echoing uh, the language we we see frequently in Genesis one. Uh, let the earth bring forth. Let the seas teem. Um, in a sense, uh, God creates by. Whole, giving creatures the gift of being, and then says, "Do it yourself. <laughs> um, go, go, go your own way. I will sustain you as you go your own way." And as human creatures have gone their own way, um, it, it 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 led the Creator to the cross. Yeah, but you also see a kind of delight from the Creator's point of view in the creature becoming itself becoming oh, definitely. Yes. its own thing um, and this is where your where your passion for, yes. for, for for gerard manny hopkins comes in i think yes yes it's very good uh yeah yeah uh and so and <clears throat> yeah i don't really want to dive into hopkins but hopkins uh as well, a as a, i mean there's uh, a the, the franciscan link is fascinating isn't it i mean yeah hopkins of course himself was a jesuit he he was a, he was a, he was a, an adult convert to Catholicism, and then became a Jesuit. But he, as as in his Jesuit studies, he came across Duns Scotus and was delighted to find somebody saying what he had always uh, felt that uh, that creation had this intrinsic isness, its its goodness, um, its and you know, it, it, I, I, I can't. I can, I can only do it best by just quoting Hopkins. Uh, one of one of Hopkins' poet, poems, well-known poems, is "Pied Beauty." Uh, <clears throat> Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color, as a brinded cow, for rose mole, all in stipple upon trout that swim. And it goes on and it is uh, all things counter original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle. Freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. But what what God is fathering forth is uh, is always uniqueness, this distinctness, things that are that are that are dappled, uh, that are high, varied, um, which is the whole this whole astonishing creation that we find ourselves in um and that links with another yeah. an, another idea that uh, you found in in hopkins about selving you know the the thing becoming itself yeah uh, another well-known hopkins poem uh, uh begins as kingfishers as kingfishers catch fires dragonflies draw flame as uh tumbled and over uh, over rim and roundy wells stones ring each 
tucked string uh, tells each swung bow uh, something. I'm getting it wrong. Uh, tells out that being indoors each one dwells. Selves it goes itself. Myself it speaks and and spells. Uh, what I do is me. For that I came. And this is simply expressing this this uh, this uh, scotist idea of the hexiatus of things. The the uniqueness of each of each thing, um, which the, the creation uh, delights its its business is to be itself, um, and yet human beings and and that's the first eight lines of the sonnet. The next eight, six lines it says, Hopkins says, "I say more, the just man justices," and what he means by just is a person who acts as Christ acts <laughs> and Christ and, and this in uh, Hopkins other uh, uh, some of his prose works makes it clear that the, the central fact and understanding God in Christ is sacrifice that God gives himself for the sake of others we see that most clearly in the cross but um, in in giving himself, he gives others a being, a space to be. So uh, our very being is in some sense bought at the price of God's self-giving, self-emptying. Um, and 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 there here we, then we 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 come to that great text in in, in Philippians 2, uh, who uh, describes Christ as being in the form of God. Um, um, being God, emptied himself. And that, I think, begins to help me bring together uh, all these Christological texts that link Christ and creation. Mm -hmm. Creation is, in a sense, God's continual self-emptying. Not that we're seeing more of God, but we're seeing God creating space for other things to be themselves. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah. I mean, you, you clearly get kind of great inspiration from that and a, and a great sense of a cosmic purpose that god's cosmic purpose in giving life to these other creatures but um you, i mean you mention in the book that this idea of dun scotus has been heavily criticized isn't it by contemporary theologians the um uh, radical orthodoxy movement and you know um a uh, former colleague uh, at uh, Regent College, um, Hans Bosma, uh, attacks Dun Scotus on precisely this point that somehow or other this rips apart the sacramental kind of um, tapestry that uh, that medieval Christianity had kind of put together this this kind of sacred universe, um, and what what it leads to is an autonomous modern world you know it leads to the enlightenment it leads to a mechanistic godless universe i mean what you know you 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 clearly have your own critique of the enlightenment but i mean do you see the force of that or do you think that's a misunderstanding well, I do, but i understand the criticism very well um i, I just think it's <laughs> it's wrong uh <clears throat> um a uh a phrase from hans's book and i i great respect for Hans as a scholar and a, and a friend, but we certainly disagree on this point. Um, uh, Hans's book that you referred to as, I think, A Sacred Tapestry is the name of it, something like that, A Sacramental Worldview. Uh, <clears throat> he says, preachers have only a borrowed reality. And by that he means that their, their ultimate reality is God's. Um, uh, you you subtract God from a creature in a way there's nothing left. I, that's that's that that he, he wouldn't say that. But if creatures have only a borrowed reality, then that 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 goes against this idea, and it's his way of, of uh, arguing against this idea of the university of being. Um, <clears throat> they they don't have their own being; their ultimate central being is God's, and so. The, the path of creation is to, is to, in a sense, to be reunited with God. And that, 
I, I don't exactly disagree with that, but uh, I think that that way of putting it, Hans's way and the radical orthodox way of putting it, uh, doesn't do justice to the genuine otherness of creatures. They, we are reunited with God in distinctive otherness, an otherness which God's love maintains in its very otherness, in its own selfhood, its own being. And, uh, and that's, again, where the idea of kenosis, where the, where the cross comes in, why that image of, of the Celtic cross, here, I've got a, a picture of it, yeah, uh, is so important. Um, there's also a, a kind of Celtic cross on our lawn that our son made. Um, it, it's significant because it has the circle, which is a good symbol for creation, for all that is. But there's something bigger than the circle, which is the cross, which holds it in being. It provides a center for creation. So uh, the, 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 I think the, the kind of symbolic wisdom of the Celtic cross is that it, it, it sees, it shows that the self-giving love of God is at the center of creation and holding creation in being. Um, the, uh, why, I, I don't at all deny the, uh, or disagree with the, the, uh, the idea that the, the one idea, one way in which Scotus's and especially uh, uh, William of Ockham's ideas have been taken is to, is to flatten the world, to drain it of, of sacramental significance. Um, but that, that's not the only way it could go. And mm -hmm. I, I do spend some time in the book talking about um, where, where, where in some sense science went wrong with, uh, uh, with, with William of Ockham, part, partly, but more with the tendency to, to, uh, to say that the, you can express the heart of things in numbers, you can reduce things to to numbers and laws and diagrams, and that certainly does drain the wonder from things, the mystery from things. But um, true science never loses sight of the wonder and the mystery, um, and 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 the uh, the reduction of things to numbers is one very useful way of. Um, of knowing the world, but it's not the most important way. The most important way is seeing it, loving it, delighting in it. Um, the sort of thing that's expressed in poetry. Um, one of the, one of the you um, McGilchrist here somewhere because McGill, McGill, yeah. uh, Ian McGilchrist, a Scottish psychiatrist, uh, um, also a literary scholar originally, uh, has argued very persuasively that we do have we we have two brains, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. Uh, that um, operate in you know in conjunction with each other, but they see the world in very different ways. One way reduces the world to things that can be uh, used and simplified. It simplifies the world in order to use it. But the other way delights in the world for what it is. We need both. Um, but what he argues is that the 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 way that simplifies for the purposes of use has become the master and the real master should be the world uh, the 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 part of the part of us that is, is able to to love the world for itself it's always mm -hmm. impressed by its wonder its mystery its otherness one of the people that you uh, mention various points during the book and you clearly have got a great admiration for is the uh, biologist eo wilson and and you you put him you hold him up as a kind of well, an exemplary scientist, really, precisely because of this element of wonder. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, he uh, he never lost his sense of wonder. Uh, he begins his biography, autobiography, The Naturalist, by describing um, um, being a memory from a boyhood, seeing a jellyfish in water, and says, um, a, a child and a, a scientist comes to deep water with a mind prepared for wonder. Um, the, the reason I find uh, Wilson, he's a, a magnificent scientist, and we owe a lot to him, and much of the science behind the very concept of biodiversity, for example, um, traces back to research that Wilson did. 
Uh, <clears throat> but Wilson also elevates reductivism. In fact, he uses the word positively. He says science has to be reductive, uh, first of all. Um, and although Wilson became a passionate, uh, I guess you could say, environmentalist, um, he uh, he he never completely, I think, uh, separates himself from the reductivism. And the sad thing about Wilson, and that's one reason I find him so fascinating, is that he he was a Christian as a as a young man, and then he found that Christianity had the the, the Southern Baptist Christianity he grew up with had no room for evolution. And evolution was a key that held everything together in his view, and uh, and he uh, he said he just drifted away, not rebellious, and uh, fortunately I I had a, a I got to meet Wilson uh, at a meeting of Christian environmentalists and scientists um, late in his life when he had just written a book called The Creation. Um, and it was uh, written as a as a as an appeal to uh, a sort of hypothetical letter to a Southern Baptist pastor, saying we may disagree on all things, but we can agree that creation is valuable. And uh, it was at the release of this book that I met Wilson, and I described the paradox. I said I don't think you will, I don't think you can get to your passionate care for creation that's rooted in wonder um, from the the strictly reductive route that you've gone, that you, you defend in, in other books like Consilience and on human nature and sociobiology, the new synthesis. And I, we, over a glass of wine and listening to a gospel quartet in a Georgia mansion, I, we had this conversation. And, yeah. And I said, well, I mean, I, it, I, it was he who used the, it was he who introduced the word paradox, isn't it? Because you'd written this article. And, uh, didn't well, you? yeah, I, I had written it. I had I'd given a talk at the, um, at the uh, British Linnaean Society, uh, and in which I ended by, by talking about the the tragedy of E.O. Wilson, uh, that he that his Christianity didn't allow him to put um, the wonder that I see only fully understandable uh, in in a belief in a creator, uh, together with his understanding of uh, of, of of the evolutionary picture which he has done so much to help us uh, know and i asked him if he'd read this and i he and he said he would i sent it my article he read it carefully he said you know i agree with you but i'd simply call it the paradox of eo wilson not the tragedy of eo wilson so <laughs> i I'm, I'm so grateful for that little exchange <laughs> yeah fascinating and uh you know, he's obviously somebody you 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 res you have a great deal of respect for but uh this idea of the tragedy i mean you, you talk about the tragedy of the faith um, the, the Christian faith that he was brought up in and that it it didn't uh, enable him to see that the creator is defined not uh, not primarily by law, but by love. That was you, what you said was the tragedy of the kind of Christianity that he rejected. And I wonder, wasn't that, the, was, wasn't there, as you're writing about your own background, I mean, I wonder if there isn't a, a degree of that in, the kind of Christianity that you grew up in as well. Very much. Um, and I, I, I just feel myself very fortunate that I, that I, that I never, I didn't, I never, I never drifted away uh, as, as, as Wilson said he did from his Christian core. And yet I so easily could have, I, I don't want to get too personal here, but I, I just came back from a visit, first visit since COVID to my family in Oregon. And we had, and I, and I actually uh, gave a copy of this book uh, to some of them, including my brother, who made it clear <laughs> that he's not going to agree with it. He'll read it, but he's not going to agree with it. Um, and that he, he knows that I don't have any trouble with science or with evolution. Uh, he says he can't, he can't believe in any of that, any of that stuff. It's not, he doesn't see how he can hold an evolutionary picture together with a biblical picture. And uh, that is a that is a huge uh, stumbling block to many, many Christians, which of course blinds them to science and and blinds them to the really to the wonder of the world. It's um, a massive, I, it's a massive mission. Mi 
mystological problem now, isn't it, for the church? This it is. It, it's almost like we've got a two sorts of people: those who accept the kind of um, the basis of inquiry and discovery, the scientific method, if you like, and those who rooted unfortunately in a, a kind of um a certain sort of christian theology reject covid science climate change evolution i mean this is really an extraordinary cultural divide now i'm afraid so um I, again to quote my my brother <laughs> um he of course this has a political dimension and mm. This all came up when I asked. Just genuinely, I, I need I, I I need to know to be able to tell my Christian friends how it is so many Christians in America can support Donald Trump. <laughs> and he got quite angry at that point. Um, he said, "Well, first of all, I agree with his policies completely." <clears throat> and uh, and. The point he made is, I don't believe in this climate change stuff. The other, if the climate's changing, God's changing it, and if it's going to be fixed, God will fix it. At that point, I don't know where to where to go. So mm. we got in the car and yeah. drove off. At that point. Yeah, it's just a, <laughs> it's a sad thing we, to me. How do we encourage in uh, of ourselves, in others, in our churches? Um, a sense of wonder. It, it it may be that some people have kind of born with it. <laughs> um, you know, for, for other people, we go through life kind of blindly just accepting the way things are or um, the way life is. We don't actually have that insight into the wonder of things. How do we encourage yeah. that in ourselves and others? Well, I think everybody does. I, I know my brother does uh, too. Uh, but how do you connect that with uh, with your faith is, is another issue, I guess. Um, I think one of the main ways is through art. It's through through literature, through poetry, through music, through uh, taking other people's wonder, what, what other people have done with their wonder at the world, filtered through their own creativity, uh, and in a sense, given back to the world, given back to us, given back to God. So I see um, human imagination, human creativity as, as as a major way of reintroducing people to the wonder of the natural world. Um, although I have to say the most important way is to just get people into the natural world, get them uh, off their screens, which we are on now, <laughs> uh, outdoors, uh, with open eyes and open senses. Uh, and uh, one of the great uh, fearful things about our time is that we're living in more and more of a virtual world, um, a world that has been digitally simplified. Uh, and doesn't just pour down on us with continual surprise like uh, any step outside will do do to you. Mm. I mean, it's it's remarkable actually the way in which I mean you talked about the importance of art there. Uh, it's clearly been incredibly important in your life, isn't it? And and in some ways, one can see the way that you've put this book together and put your thinking together very much with the help of the poets, and particularly of Ger Gerard. Manly Hopkins, and that is a that is a wonderful thing. But um, to go back to then the real color kind of culmination of the book, which is this bringing together of these great themes of the incarnation, God as Trinity, a kind of hospitable relational God, and this amazing notion of the self-emptying of God that you find in Philippians 2, a great uh, Christological passage in, in Philippians 2. It's clearly what has really helped you to bring the science 
to bring evolu- you know, your understanding of evolution, the incredible age of the universe, um, and these and 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 your Christian commitment to the atonement, to the the work of Christ on the cross. This is the point at which it all comes together to you in this theme of kenosis. Definitely. And and it I guess it speaks to one of the it, it's a challenge. This view of the world, this view of the history of, 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 of the universe is a challenge to both uh well as I say in my introduction, uh a preface somewhere, it's it's a challenge to everybody has a religion, including the atheist. It's a challenge to religious people of both theist and atheist persuasions who are having trouble with their faith because it's it's a challenge to Christian faith because we can explain the world naturally. More and more, we're able to explain things naturally, including ourselves. Um, but it's a challenge to the to the to the atheist um, who believes that ultimately the universe is is an accident with no purpose. Because the more we explain naturally, the more marvelous and miraculous it becomes. Um, the universe is uh, incredibly fine-tuned for our existence, for example. Um, uh, it, 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 it shouldn't be so friendly to life as it is. Uh, the odds against it are, are, are incalculably great. Um, uh, the only the only possible way out of the, the universe being such a coincidence um, is uh, the hypothesis that there are an almost infinite number of universes that keep bubbling into existence, and we just are very fortunate in the one we ended up in because it it uh, it's 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 no, it's it's no surprise if there's an infinite number of universes that one of them would be so finely tuned for human existence. But of course, there's not the trace, slightest trace of evidence of another universe. This is all just speculation, partly to relieve one of the necessity of uh, believing in a creator. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I want to stress here that I, I don't, uh, I, although I sympathize with those who, like the intelligent design movement, uh, find evidence for God stepping in and uh, and 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 you know find finding sort of a uh, footprints of God in creation. Well, um, that leads to a kind of God of the gaps theology. It says we can find, uh, we can explain most things, but there are some gaps we can't explain, and that's where God does things. But increasingly, we're able to fill those gaps um, with explanations. Um, and uh, and yet, once we've filled them, we're left with this astonishing miracle that there's anything at all. So I go back to um, the, the two questions that I say began the book, um, two, two singularities, two miracles, two mysteries. Why is there anything at all? And an even greater mystery, why are we able to be aware of it? Why are we able to wonder at it? Um, and, uh, and that's what I think the... Uh, the cross helps us understand <clears throat> the the problem with the kenosis theme is um that for people in the kind of the classical classical orthodoxy in some ways it seems to challenge where you're talking about not simply the the self emptying of the sun Jesus Christ in the incarnation, as it were, but this applying this to God, the Holy Trinity, that you challenge the idea of omniscience, a God who knows everything. How could God know everything? And there's an emptying that goes on here um, where the future is open in some uh, in, in real way. Similarly, the, you know, omniscience, knowing, every, knowing everything. Um, omnipotent um and a god who who can't suffer who can't change well this you know this universe is changing all the time it's it's developing and and isn't there isn't there some sense in which god 
therefore has to kind of change with it. All of those things have been heavily criticised, haven't they, by folks um, within the kind of classical theological tradition. How do you, what is your answer, to, you know, what is your your kind of, your instinctive kind of response to that? I mean, obviously, one can't go. We can't go into your your your, your kind of detailed uh, answer to it. I mean, what 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 would you say? Because those you no know, those those notions of omnipotence of God, omniscience, all knowing of God, the you know the the God who doesn't change. Those are dear dear kind of Christian ideas, aren't they? And biblical ideas to an extent. They are, and they have. <clears throat> They have some, you can certainly argue them biblically and theologically and logically. Um, and I don't, I guess I, I like the quick answer is I don't try to resolve that, but I also come back to a point that I think Jürgen Moltmann has made very well um, that in his book, The Crucified God and others, that the clearest picture we have of God is on the cross. The New Testament is very clear about that. This shows us the heart of God. This shows us the nature of God. And uh, I somehow we have to hold that in tension with these pictures of a God who does not suffer, a God who um, knows every decision that we will make. Uh, um, that a God that in it, it's it's very hard to reconcile, and I, I, there have been all kinds of good attempts to do this, a complete omniscience with with freedom. Um, somehow, I think one of the best analogies is something like a jazz musician who improvises with the changes that are brought into the score and brings or or a, a a master weaver who incorporates even the mistakes of the weavers into a greater pattern um did he know the pattern at the beginning i'll just soon not answer that question but god as one of the writers i i use quite a bit the wh vanstone puts it uh, creation is secure not because because God has mapped it all out, but because God will never abandon it, and that willingness to not abandon creation is what we see in the cross. Um, I know this puts me close to the brink of what's called open theology, which some have called heresy. I don't believe it is, and I don't want to quite align myself with that position because I think we just have to hold these mysteries in a kind of paradoxical tension and that's uh, that's the best i can say however i must say i i'm just uh, i i i'm uh, just beginning uh, advising a, a regent student on their who's a doctor on their thesis and one of the things they're he's looking at is the way in which the spirit has been left out of so much um Christian environmental writing, including my own. Um, he brought his book out and pointed out my index where I have very few references to the spirit. Uh, <clears throat> and I I think that um, whatever this whatever this third member of the Trinity is, it is it is God's presence with us, with every creature always um, now. And um It doesn't answer the questions, the the, the, the dilemmas of uh, omniscience and, uh, and and an impassionate, unpassionate God and so forth. But I I think we I, th I think he's he's challenged me that I I need to take more seriously the not only the the canonic word in creation, but the but the creating spirit in creation. Mm. Fascinating. Now that you've finished this book, Lauren, which you've been working on for so long, um, which, as I say, contains so much poetry and reflection on poetry, but none of your own. 
which I blame you for. I, I, I accuse you for leaving out your own poetry from this uh, this volume, but I, I think in much of your own poetry, these themes do come through in a, a quite a remarkable way. Um, are you going to write more poetry now that you've finished uh, this? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to know what I would like to do more, I'd like to write more poetry. And in the in the introduction to that uh, collection of poetry, Imago Mundi, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, a friend of mine, and Ron Ron Reed encouraged me to collect the poetry, and I I, I let him do it, uh, and uh, I'm so glad he did. At about the same time that you decided to make a film on this book, uh, when it was far from finished, and both the film and the poetry helped me realize that I am working on one big project, mm -hmm. and uh, I put the poetry aside largely while doing the book. I do hope that. Um, before I turn completely senile, I can continue. Writing. I've got a lot of, a lot of. I'd like to write more poetry. I very um, much and hope I will, so. We'll do. I will. I will do that. <laughs> yeah, I very much hope so. Um, the film, the 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 volume of poems is called Imago Mundi. That's published by Regent uh, Press, I believe. Is that right, Laura? Regent published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Published that. Um, the film made in 2016 is called making peace with creation it's available for free um and uh i'm sure if you just google the title making peace with creation we didn't call it circles and the cross because um it was pretty clear that uh, the book wouldn't be ready actually at the same time and we don't want to uh, confuse things but the book is now available and it's great thank you so much for writing it circles and uh Circles and the Cross, published by Cascade, Whip and Stock, uh, and um, available from all good booksellers, especially the Regent College Bookstore. So thank you, Lauren, for writing it. Thank you for uh, your um, your your teaching over the years and your um, your inspiration to so many of us to um, to to think about the world we're living in uh, critically and Christianly. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And I wanted I wanted to thank you for your encouragement because that making that film was a great act of faith. It's uh, it's common to write to make films about books, but usually the books are finished. This was seven years in the future when you decided to make a film on my book. So I appreciate it. It's a wonderful film, quite apart from my part of it, my control in it. There's the book again, Circles and the Cross by Lauren Wilkinson. Thank you. <laughs>